Welcome to the Pentecostals of Lee Road. Thank you for being here at 930 for Christian Education on a kind of a, another dreary rainy day, but God is good and we need the sunshine, we need the rain, we need it all. I'm thankful that he knows what we need when we need it. Uh, we want to start with prayer this morning. Uh, first for Sister Donna. She was uh, ended up in the emergency room last night with a kidney stone. And uh, she is back home doing, doing well, from what I understand. Um, but we need just want to keep her in our prayers this morning, and that's why she's not standing here before you. And uh, God knows what he's doing, and I'm excited that uh, we're going to have a great baby dedication day today. I'm excited that my youngest is getting dedicated to the Lord. And uh, it's an exciting day. There will be a lot, of, a lot of families, a lot of guests here. You see the reserve signs on the seats. That's for all the family members of those who are uh, getting dedicated today, and the house will be full. I have no doubt about that, so we're thankful for that, and they are going to feel, everyone here is going to feel the power and the presence of the Lord, and that's the, that's the goal. So can we go to the Lord right now and ask him to bless our day and, and lift up Sister Donna? God, I thank you for this day. Lord, you know exactly what we need when we need it. I'm so thankful. God, to have the honor and privilege to live for you in this day and age. Lord, you've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light for such a time as this. And Lord, even though we don't fully understand everything and the whys that that things happen sometimes, we know that you're in control. And Lord, we know that you do all things well. And I pray you bless our time together. Bless this lesson this morning. Bless our service today. Lord, we lift Sister Donna up to you. I pray you ease any more pain that she may be in this morning. I pray that you bring strength to her mind, body, and spirit. Thank you for all those who will be here in, in service with us today. Thank you for all the, the new life and the babies that have been born that are, will, will be dedicated to you this morning. And let your perfect will be done today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, I have a, a lesson for you this morning, and um, it may be a little bit different than, than what you're used to at 930. And I'm, I know I'm usually with the young people next door, and they are rocking and rolling, and they are doing uh, just phenomenal, godly proud of each and every one of them. But this lesson this morning is, uh, is a personal, is born out of a personal study of mine, and uh, I, I am a man of faith. I have the gift of faith. I fully believe that. It's been confirmed. I believe that God can and will do anything that we ask or think. I believe in, in, in his exceeding abundant Willingness and power to answer each and every prayer that we pray. I believe the Bible says, ask and you shall receive, knock and the door will be opened, seek and you will find. I believe each and every scripture of faith that's in the Bible. But how many of you in here would raise your hand and say, there are some prayers that you have prayed that have not been or have not yet been answered by the Lord? It's all of us, I believe. And certainly, certainly myself. I have many prayers that I have prayed that, uh, that are in connection with some prophetic words that have yet to come to pass. I believe they will. But as of yet, those prayers are unanswered. So studying faith throughout the Word of God, it, it occurred to me that I wanted an answer. I'm pretty uh, pragmatic. I'm, I'm a relatively practical thinker. And I, it, it bothered me at a point in, in the past that, you know, why... If the Bible says, ask and you shall receive, I believe that. So why do I ask sometimes and not receive? What, what's the deal? Is it something that I'm doing wrong? Is, have I misinterpreted Scripture? What, what is, what's the reason behind that? And then it, through study and prayer, and you know, it's so important to read and study the Word of God because if, if we don't do that, we will uh, just open ourselves up to frustration and and we, we won't rightly divide the word and we'll hear things and our minds will play tricks on us and our minds will go places that uh, the Lord never intended for them to go. And before we know it, if we're not getting a steady dose of the word and really reading and understanding what we're reading, then, then we'll get discouraged and we'll start, our, our faith will take a hit and we'll start believing things that are not true. So I want to talk to you this morning on this topic, unanswered but not unheard unanswered but not unheard. And I'm going to give you really four, four reasons of why, uh, from Scripture, our prayers may not be answered when we pray them. Uh, let's start in Daniel 
chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. This is the story of three men with funny names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are about to be thrown into the fiery furnace for not bowing down before the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. And this is what they said when they refused. They said, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from burning fire, from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, they started with faith. They said, he is able, we know our God. We know him, we have a relationship with him. We know that he is able. We know that he can. And we know that if it's his will, that he will do it. We know, but, but if not, regardless, if he does not answer this prayer right now, Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will still not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set before us. Verse 19, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he spake and he commanded them, and they were thrown in the fiery furnace. If you don't know the rest of the story, there was a fourth man that was seen in the furnace, and they were saved, and uh, not a hair was singed on their bodies. The Lord did, in fact, came come through but those three words in their declaration are very important but if not we believe we're going to stand firm we're going to declare it that he can and that he he's able to but if not guess what we're still not going to have a wavered faith we're still not going to backslide we're still not going to throw in the towel we're still not going to bow down to a god that is not him so The question, of course, is has God ever answered your prayers? And yes, just as we all raised our hand and said, you know, there are prayers that have gone unanswered. Every one of us could raise our hands and say, but there are a multitude of prayers that God has answered. We know God is a prayer-answering God. But what happens when the but if not actually comes to pass? What happens when but if not actually happens? Uh, Back in the... I don't know the exact year. It was the mid to late 90s. There was a really popular country music singer you might have heard of named Garth Brooks. And uh, he wrote a song or sang a song that became very popular. And um, I think I heard it maybe once on the radio or something. You know, back as as a teenager. But it went, you know, the words were, were this. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Remember when you're talking to the man upstairs that just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. And then at the end of the song he says, I guess the good Lord knows what he's doing after all. (laughs) And the, the moral of that song and what drove him to write that song was, you know, he tells the story about how years well into his adult life he ran into his high school sweetheart and and. Long story short, she had not turned out to, to be the, the woman that he thought she was as a teenager. And he said, I remember praying, you know, at night as a teenage boy, God, make her mine. You know, let us connect and let us get married and ha- live happily ever after. And don't raise your hand if you can relate to that kind of story. But, uh, you know, and he says, but then I, I, met, I ran into her years later, a decade or two later. And I, think, I thought to myself, wow, thank God for unanswered prayers. Thank God that he didn't answer that prayer that I prayed as a 16-year-old boy. And he, and he went on to say, you know, some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers, and I guess the good Lord does know what he's doing after all. So the word says that everyone has been given a measure of faith, and we know that. We understand that. We are people of faith. We believe in the power of the name of Jesus. We believe in the word of God. We know about the power and the importance of faith. We have faith in this book. We know that God, what God said he will do, he will do. We have faith in the name of Jesus and in his power and ability to do what men say is impossible. And we see that happen week in and week out. We see God revealing himself and showing himself mighty week in and week out. And just uh, on checking Facebook, I get some of my social news on Facebook. I don't post much on Facebook. I don't really, I'm not big into Facebook, but there are some some family news and things that I can only get from, you know, because people won't communicate except through social media. I don't really understand that sometimes, but it's just how it is. So I catch up on some news on on Facebook, but uh, we did, I saw a picture this morning as I was just scrolling through of, of Roger going home. What a miracle. What an answered prayer. My goodness. 
God still does the miraculous. The doctors, Sister Liz said the doctors are still confused. And I'm, I'm just, it, it's just such an honor to serve a God that still confounds the quote-unquote wise of this world. And it's the power of faith and the power of prayer in his name. We don't doubt for a second that God has the ability to heal every sickness, to heal any disease, to mend every broken heart, to mend every broken bone, to heal every injury, to free every type of addiction that's out there. We don't doubt for a second that God has the ability to restore every relationship or situation that's ever been damaged. But what happens when you've prayed and nothing happens? That's the question. What happens when we've prayed and it seems as if nothing is happening? Maybe the sickness remains. Maybe it gets worse. Maybe the family situation takes a turn for the worse. Do you ever want to ask God why? It's human nature. I've, been, I've, I've heard in the past and I've been taught at times, you know, don't question the Lord. Well, I would like to say that I've never questioned God, but it's human nature. My mind just works that way. I want to know why. I want to know why. Lord, why is this, this happening? Why does God seem to answer some prayers and not others? Number one, this is the, one, the first reason. It's found in James chapter 4 and verse 3. And I thank God that he's got kind of a, you know, uh, he has our back. Because there are some prayers that I've prayed that I know were out of the will of God. And if they had been answered, then I would have been stuck. And I would have been uh, in a worse situation than had he uh, not answered those prayers. But James chapter 4 and 3 says, You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. In other words, there are some prayers that we can pray and if we're not careful, if we're not spiritually minded, if we don't have the, the heart of God, or if we just maybe we're caught up in a situation, we can ask something that is contrary to the will of God. I can remember praying for uh, new vehicles at times in my past. Now, God will provide, and he has provided vehicles, but, you know, I, I came to the conclusion after I totaled a second Mustang that it was not the will of God for me to drive Ford Mustangs. So I stopped praying that God would provide me another Mustang, because if he had, I might not be here tonight, today. Um, I missed, dodged two bullets there, and he protected me in both, both instances years ago. But uh, had I prayed for that, then you know what, that would have been asking amiss. But if there's no greater purpose involved, and the prayer is only to fulfill a fleshly, lustful desire, then chances are God is not going to answer. Uh, praying for a new sports car so you can be the most popular, praying for, you know, Material things that really, if we were really, really honest with ourselves, maybe we don't need them necessarily. Maybe we just we're just wanting, you know, the 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 fame or the the blessings that come with that, or whatever the case may be. There are some things that we just pray about sometimes that are amiss. That we, it's really not the heart of God. You know, God. I think sometimes the Bible says, um, you know, that that if we're not careful. Will be it will end up like the Israelites. Remember the Israelites, it wasn't God's will that they have a king, but they prayed and prayed and prayed and, and treated the Lord so much that finally God said, okay, it's not my will, it's not what's best for you, but you seem to be harping on this and you won't. You, you keep asking amiss, but you, you're, you're not moving off of it. Fine, I'll give you a king, and he raised up Saul. And it didn't have a happy ending. It wasn't God's intention, it wasn't his will. So we need to make sure that we, we fast and pray and make sure that what we're, what we're praying about, if it involves some type of material thing or, or something we're really, really, you know, we, we think sometimes that we have it figured out. God, if I could just get this lump sum of money or if I could just get this new vehicle or get this new house, then, then that's going to solve all my problems where really God's saying, no, I put you here. I've provided a shelter over your head. It may not be what you really, really want, but it's what you need. For this time, and maybe I want you to save some money instead of paying it on a, you know, a big mortgage note, or maybe you need to understand and appreciate the gas mileage you get with that smaller, almost wore-out vehicle than getting a, a a new truck. Now I'm dealing with that now, driving across the lake in my new truck. Uh, but I did not ask amiss, and I did confirm that the Lord was okay with me uh, getting a new vehicle before I did. But um, 
And it had, had I got it earlier, even though I wanted it for years, had I gotten it earlier, I probably would not have been able to afford it. So God is, uh, God is watching our backs. But that's, that's reason number one. We ask amiss. Now, number two, the second reason that God may or may not answer our prayers at times is this. He wants us to be productive. Now, let's look at the life of Paul. What would have happened if the Apostle Paul, who ended up in prison a number of times, but if the, the Apostle Paul in prison pleading with God to let him out of prison instead of writing letters to the churches? Now, I believe Paul probably did pray, God, help me to get out of this situation. God, help me to uh, help them to see the error of their ways. Help me to be free from this prison. No one wants to be in a prison. But look at what happened while he was in prison. So maybe our prayers sometimes aren't answered when we think they want to, when we think that they should be answered because God is wanting us to do something special and unique through our pain, through our dilemma. The Apostle Paul wrote most of the New Testament from prison. I, I don't think I would have passed that test. I would have written probably a lot of letters, but it would have been to uh, anyone and everyone I knew, you know, senators, representatives, lawyers, everybody that I could. I probably would not have thought about encouraging churches or, you know, giving guidance to a new church. <laughs> but sometimes our unanswered prayers are simply God watching and waiting to see what we're going to do while we wait for him to answer, while we wait for him to reveal his power. Psalms chapter 40 and verse 1, this is biblical. I waited patiently for the Lord. We don't know how long David waited, but he said, I waited patiently for the Lord. And eventually he inclined unto me and he heard my cry. Lamentations 3 and 26. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Micah 7 and 7. Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. There's no time frame set on those scriptures. I wish there was. It would be a lot easier for us. Lord, I will wait patiently for you for six months, and then I know my answer will come. Or I will wait patiently for you for a year, and then I know I can expect for my prayer to be answered. I look at our bishop who I know and love so dearly, and, and we've been praying for 11 years. Bishop said this morning that in a couple weeks it will be the 11th anniversary of his surgery that changed his life forever. Do I still believe God's got a full healing and restoration? Absolutely. Without the shadow of a doubt. His word is true. His word is pure. There's been too many prophetic words spoken, too many prayers prayed. But he didn't put a time frame on it. Absolutely. It would make it easier for everybody that's praying about something if, if there was a time frame, but there's not. But there's not. That's why the Bible says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He didn't say how long we, had, we would have to stand. He just said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And if you find yourself in a prison, a prison of unanswered prayers, look for a way to be productive in, even in the midst. Look for a way to to encourage somebody else, even in that situation. Look for what God wants you to do and wants you to accomplish, even when others would say, man, he's lost it. There are times when we don't get an immediate answer to our prayers because God is saying, just wait a little while, slow down. I want to see what you are going to do until I give you an answer. How are you going to respond to the Lord telling you, not now? Not now. It's very important what we do while we are waiting while we're waiting on God, he may be waiting on us. Think about that. While we are waiting on God to answer a prayer, he may very well be waiting and watching us. Number three, the third reason God may not answer our prayers. God is trying to teach us something. See, the Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust and that good things happen to bad people and at times bad things happen to good people. Just ask the man named Job. If you don't know the story, I would encourage you to read it. It's, it's a fascinating, powerful story. Job lost his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his camels. That, that, that's his wealth. Back in those days, that was how you measured wealth. He lost it all. In addition to that, he lost his children, his sons, his daughters, and he lost 
Lastly, he lost his health with The Bible says he had painful boils that sprung up all over his body, and the only way he could get any kind of relief was to take broken pottery and and scrape them and puncture them and let that infection just ooze out. It's it's kind of disgusting, but think about that. What in the world? If anybody had a right to be discouraged, if anyone had an excuse, it was Job. Did he pray? Yes. Did he deserve it? No. What did the Bible say? He was righteous. He was just. None like him found on the earth. He essentially lost his money, his family, and his health. Was he confused? Probably so. Do you think he questioned God? Absolutely. Do you think he wondered when God was going to answer his prayers? Yep. Absolutely. Job 13 and 15, yet he still said this, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. See, Job Job didn't... uh, It wasn't the Lord that was slaying him. It was the Lord that was allowing it. But God wasn't physically doing it. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't seem to hear you sometimes? It wasn't God who was slaying Job, but he was allowing it. Could it be that what you're confused about, what you cry about, what you're praying about, is something that God is allowing to happen to you? He's allowing you to go through it so that you will learn to trust in him no matter what? Could that be? I'm not saying this is what it is in every situation. But could it be? And I know I can speak personally. There are things that I've been through that I could only learn trust if I go through those things. Challenges and situations I didn't choose to be in. But I, I can look back and say I would not have learned to trust God and to walk by faith unless I had gone through that situation. I didn't choose and I didn't deserve to to lose a job last year, the week after Miles, the baby who will be dedicated this morning, my second child. The week after he was born, I get a pink slip. Oh, by the way, Friday's your last day. Did I deserve that? Absolutely not. And to this day, the the lady who let me go, you know, contacted me and wished me well and can't wait to bring me back and all this. And, well, God bless you. That's not happening. (laughs) You know, not without a written contract sealed with our blood that you will never lay me off again with a week's notice. But maybe that's another issue I need to pray about. <laughs> but God has provided a, a, a bigger, better job, and, and the Lord never ceases to amaze me. But moving on. But had I not gone two months without work, I would not have learned to trust in God and to walk by faith as I ha- as I am able to now. It's just a fact. Just a fact. I had never, never, from the time I was an adult, 18 years and up, I had never not had a job to go to on a Monday morning. I was taught to work. My dad uh, and mother always worked my whole life. And my dad, you know, had, at one point he had decades of perfect attendance at work. And just, I mean, he he taught me the value of work. Taught me a work ethic, and I never had a, I never not had a job to go to on a Monday morning until last summer. I didn't know what to do with myself. I thought it was great for the first two weeks, and then uh, it, you go stir crazy. And you're like, okay, all right, God, I enjoyed my vacation, enjoyed the time with the baby at home. All right, now you can show up. It wasn't until two months later, not two weeks, that he finally did. But through that time. I can honestly say that it was a test, and and the Lord was watching and waiting and seeing, okay, are you going to keep giving? Are you going to really put your money where your mouth is and and continue to trust me? Are you going to walk by faith? Are you going to get a negative attitude? Are you going to panic? Are you going to be full of fear? What was he saying? Those were things that I could only learn through that situation. Now, with that said, I hope I passed that test and I never have to retake it, but that's just how it is. But the next time you go through what we would call hell on earth, and it doesn't seem like God is anywhere around, I would encourage you to make a point to tell him that you trust in him no matter what and watch what happens. Proverbs chapter 3 still rings true. Trust in the Lord in all your ways and acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Ask the young man named Joseph who had a promise from God about his future and he ended up in a palace. What a great story. But between the promise and the palace... There was a pit, a man named Potiphar, and there was a prison. Between the time that the prayer was prayed and the prophecy was spoken and, and, and it was received and it was even declared, and between that point and the point of the fulfillment, 
There was a whole lot of bad stuff that he had to endure. There was a, a pit. He was thrown in the pit, and then he was falsely accused by Potiphar and then thrown in a prison. We want to go from the promise straight into the palace, and if it works for, out for you that way, great. That's phenomenal. Give God the glory. But most people have to go through the pits and the prisons and deal with the Potiphar's before God can elevate them to the palace. Why is that? Why is that? Well, we can't truly appreciate the palace. This is what I believe. You can't truly appreciate the palace until you've been through the pit and the prison. You can't truly understand the beauty of a palace until you've experienced the stench of a prison. Have you ever been misunderstood or falsely accused? Congratulations, so is Jesus. You're in good company. How did you respond in that situation? Could it be? Now, I'm just throwing a lot of questions out here for you to apply to your own situation and your own unanswered prayers. But could it be that God is using people in your life to help make you more like Jesus? My wife has taught me one thing, that uh, a statement she's made to me, and she reminds me uh, on the rare occasion when I might be complaining about something or expressing some frustration about somebody else in my life. Uh, she said, baby, they're a tool to make you a jewel. Don't forget, they're a tool to make you a jewel. And I remind her of that sometimes, too. <laughs> but how true is that? Think about what Jesus did. Isn't the the point of following Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus is to discipline ourselves to be more like Jesus and to grow and to to try to become more like him? Well, why would we think that we wouldn't experience being falsely accused? We wouldn't experience being mistreated at times and and, and abused at times. And We can't become like Jesus if we don't experience some of that stuff and learn to trust in him through that. So isn't that our main goal? I failed that test many, many times, but... Uh, one statement that's been made, I think I've heard Bishop say it before, God is not like the public school system. Until you pass the test, he flunks you. There's no social promotion in the kingdom of God. Joseph was undergoing a process. You may feel like you're in a pit or a prison through no fault of your own, and even after praying about it and expecting an answer and expecting to be released and expecting to be free, you don't get miraculously delivered. Can you imagine that Joseph felt that way in the two years that he spent in prison. Maybe the first few nights was, okay, God, I can endure this for a week or two, but, you know, then I'm fully expecting you to come through. I'm fully expecting you to to redeem me in my name. My name's been dragged through the mud by this guy named Potiphar who's so high and mighty, and he's got everyone's uh, ear, and he's got influence. And But I'm I'm expecting you, Lord, to to make, make sure that, my name is clear and that you really reveal what's right and what's wrong, you know, within the next couple weeks. Didn't happen. Months went by. Didn't happen. Finally, two years later is when the Lord finally came through. What did he say? What did Joseph say? Lord, I still trust in you. I don't know what I need to learn or what you're trying to teach me or what your ultimate plan is, God, but I'm here and I'm going to be faithful. That's essentially what Joseph said. That's what he had to say and that's what we have to say when we're in a situation where God just doesn't seem like he's answering our prayers. Lord, help me to have patience with your process. I know that you mean it for good. What did Joseph tell his brothers after the fact when he was in the palace? And sure enough, that word was fulfilled. He said, you know, they were scared. They were, oh, he's going to bring some retribution on us, and he's going to punish us for what we did to him years ago. And he said, brothers, what you meant for evil, the one I serve, the one who's ultimately in charge, the one who was hearing my prayers, even though they weren't answered at the time. He meant it for good. When you don't have answers, you have to have trust. If you had answers, we wouldn't need to trust. Think about that. If we had immediate answers when we expected them each and every time, we would never really learn trust. Job learned unconditional trust. Joseph learned patience with the process. The next time your prayers go unanswered, I I would encourage you to ask God to reveal to you what lesson he's trying to teach you. When you're in a situation that's through no fault of your own, God, what are you trying to teach me? I can remember praying that prayer many times last year during uh, when I was out of work. God, I don't know what you're trying to teach me. God, help me. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm not going to lose faith. I know you're going to show up in your time. I don't want to have to ask anybody for money. I don't want to, I don't, I just don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I, Lord, I'm willing to do anything. What are you trying to teach me? And the fourth reason that God may not be answering our prayers when we think he should is you may just have a thorn in your flesh. Now, this is biblical, too. All four of these reasons are straight from the Word of God. Let's listen to the, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, in other words, unless I should get too high and mighty in myself, unless I should really be uh, prideful and become boastful in all of these things, he said, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's saying, something's happened, I've got this condition, we'll talk about it in a minute, but he said, there's a, there's a thorn in my flesh, and it was given to me, and I, I don't really understand it, I can't explain it, and God, I'm asking you to remove it. And he prayed multiple times, God, remove this, you have to take this thing from me. It, it, it's hindering me. And the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Basically what he said was, no, I'm not taking it away. I'm going to give you grace that's sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. Why? For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong, because when I'm weak, he shows up, and he manifests himself. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly, the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. See, sometimes our prayers are not answered because God is using you and your situation to display His power. Sometimes God is using you and your situation as a, a, a venue, an avenue to show and display His power. What did, uh, in John chapter 9, when the blind guy uh, met Jesus and, and he healed him, and then the Pharisees were all in a tizzy, how, can, how did this happen? You know, was he, this man was blind from birth and and was it his sin or his parents' sin? How did, why did he end up blind? And they told him, they said, well, it was just so that Jesus could reveal his glory. Just, to, just, for, just for that reason. This man had to endure blindness for years just so that on that moment Jesus could manifest his power and show the apostles and Pharisees and everybody else who was really in charge. The word thorn in this passage that Paul talks about literally means stake. It's not talking about like a rosebush thorn. This is really like a, a stake. Uh, so when Paul says he had a thorn in his flesh, it means he had some type of physical infirmity that caused him great discomfort. This was not a splinter. Uh, this, is a, this was something serious, something significant, not just a little distraction, something that Paul would think, this is going to hinder me. This is going to prevent me from, from really you know, achieving ministry success. Many scholars think that this was a, a, some kind of chronic eye impairment or uh, a, an eye condition that, that caused him to have very poor vision. We're not exactly sure, but that seems to be somewhat consensus there. History also tells us, this is, this is fascinating, that Paul was barely five foot tall, he was stoop-shouldered, and he did not have a very pleasant sounding speaking voice. Think about that. The missionary of missionaries, the one who wrote over half of the New Testament, the one who established churches, the Apostle Paul, the one who on the road to Damascus had an encounter with Jesus Christ unlike any other at the time, the greatest missionary to the known world. And he was barely five foot tall. He was stoop-shouldered and had a speaking voice that was not very pleasant for people to listen to. Paul was right with God, and he was powerfully used of God, and he was the greatest missionary to ever walk the face of the earth, yet he had to deal with unanswered prayers. Yet even the Apostle Paul had to deal with unanswered prayers. He prayed multiple times for God to heal him or to remove the issue or to take him out of the situation, but nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech. See, he knew it. He was aware that he, his speaking voice was not, he wasn't a great orator. He wasn't, you know, the one who made these great speeches. He said, I, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, Paul looked and sounded like a lunatic until he started laying hands on people and they started recovering, until he started laying hands on crippled people and they started walking, until he started laying hands on blind people and their eyes were healed. See, Paul, from the outside, when someone just walked up and and heard the Apostle Paul He didn't sound very enticing. He didn't sound very smart. He didn't sound uh, very appealing. He wasn't a great orator. He didn't, you know, draw a crowd because of his excellency of speech. But he drew a crowd because when someone was in need, he would lay his hands on them and they were instantly healed by the power of God. That's why he said, I'm I'm not coming to you with an excellency of speech, but in the wisdom and demonstration of the power of God. When we realize that sometimes God says not yet to our prayers, it's an opportunity to be used in the demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost that is within us. It's amazing what God will do through us when we're not holding a grudge for unanswered prayers. Paul could have very easily said, well, God, unless you remove this thorn from my flesh, unless you heal my eyes, unless you make me more presentable, I, I can't do anything. God, it's up to you, and you know, until you answer my prayers, I'm not going to do anything but he didn't do that. Sometimes the thorn in the flesh is there to ensure that God gets all the credit for anything we do through him. Think about that. Sometimes the thorn in the flesh is there simply to ensure that we can't take credit for what God does through us. Paul said, so that I won't be boastful and that I don't get exalted above what I should, God put a thorn in my flesh. Look at what Paul did, the exploits that he had. He no doubt would have been tempted to take credit for some of that. But he said, because of this thorn in my flesh, no one could look at me and say, it's me doing this. It's only by the grace of God, and it's only God that gets the credit. Regardless of what you've been hoping for and praying for in your life, and regardless of what God's response has been up to this point, I want you to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that even though your prayers may be unanswered at this point, they've never been unheard. They're not unheard. Every prayer you've ever prayed has been heard. Every tear you ever cried has been bottled up in heaven. Your prayers may be unanswered, but they are not unheard. He sees you. He knows what you're dealing with. I would encourage you to think about, am I asking amiss? Maybe, maybe not. He may be waiting on you to do something productive before he answers. He may be trying to teach you a lesson that will serve you in the future or allow you to minister to others. Or he may just want to use a thorn in your flesh to display his power. Whatever the case may be, I can't tell you why, but I can tell you that it's not because he has not heard your prayer. I can say with a surety that God hears every prayer that you've prayed. It may be weeks or months or years or even decades that that answer has not come but it's not because he hasn't heard your prayers can we stand this morning I know we're finished a little bit early but that's okay and I just want to encourage you as we dismiss before our worship service that Don't get discouraged. Don't think that God's forgotten about you. Don't think that he doesn't hear what you pray. Don't stop praying. Don't think that just because an answer hasn't come that he hasn't heard what you've prayed and that he doesn't see your tears and that he doesn't feel your hurt. Can we bow our heads right now? Lord, I thank you for the power of your word and the power of the name Jesus. I thank you for the faith that I feel here in this room. God, I pray that a wisdom would be released into our minds and spirits today. Lord, I know there are many, many prayers that I have prayed that you have answered. And Lord, I know that there are prayers that I have prayed that you have yet to answer. 
But God, I don't doubt for a second that you've heard every prayer that I've prayed. And God, I know that my tears have been bottled up. I know that I have received every prophetic word that has been spoken unto me. Lord, I know that in your time, your will will be done in my life. And God, I pray for a wisdom to understand and, and really comprehend and, and work out in our minds, Lord, why things don't happen when we think they should. And God, I, I pray for a special sensitivity to your spirit that when we do pray and the answer is no or the answer is not yet, that we will be okay with that and, and be able to trust you through it no matter what. For Lord, your word says that you will never leave us, nor will you ever forsake us. And Lord, you've never seen your seed begging bread. Lord, I'm reminded of what the psalmist wrote in Psalms 37. I've been young, but now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Lord, your word is true. And Lord, from now till the end of time, I will hold on to every prophetic word that you've spoken to me, and I will pray it and believe and look with expectancy every day for the fulfillment of it. But until then, Lord, until then, I will investigate my motives so that I don't ask amiss. Lord, I will be productive where you've planted me. I will be productive through the, the prison times if, if you should see fit to place me there. Lord, I will be trusting in you even when I'm in a situation I don't deserve. And Lord, I will never cease to give you credit for anything good that happens. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, and I thank you for it. I pray you bless your people today, and bless this day, and let everything happen in your perfect will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Uh, let's have a great worship service today.